welcome to Old Treasures Made New, your devotional podcast on the go or at home, where we read the scriptures and reflect on them with those from the past. Today we're reading Mark 15, verses 39 to 47, and then through J.C. Ryle's expository thoughts in Mark. Please take a moment to pause and to ask the Holy Spirit to bring understanding and to apply what we hear. Mark, chapter 15, verses 39 to 47. And when the centurion, who stood facing him, saw that in this way he breathed his last, he said, Truly this man was the Son of God. There were also women looking on from a distance, among whom were Mary Magdalene, and Mary the mother of James the younger, and of Joseph, and of Salome. When he was in Galilee, they followed him and ministered to him, and there were also many other women who came up with him to Jerusalem. And when evening had come, Since it was the day of preparation, that is, the day before the Sabbath, Joseph of Arimathea, a respected member of the council, who was also himself looking for the kingdom of God, took courage and went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Pilate was surprised to hear that he should have already died, and summoning the centurion, he asked whether he was already dead. And when he learned from the centurion that he was dead, he granted the corpse to Joseph. And Joseph brought a linen shroud, and taking him down, wrapped him in the linen shroud, and laid him in a tomb that had been cut out of a rock. And he rolled a stone against the entrance of the tomb. Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of Joseph, saw where he was laid. This is the word of the Lord. The death of our Lord Jesus Christ is the most important fact in Christianity. On it depend the hopes of all saved sinners, both for time and eternity. We need not therefore to be surprised to find the reality of his death carefully placed beyond dispute. Three kinds of witnesses to the fact are brought before us in these verses we have now read. The Roman centurion, who stood near the cross, the women, who followed our Lord from Galilee to Jerusalem, and the disciples, who buried him. All were all witnesses that Jesus really died. Their united evidence is above suspicion. They could not be deceived. What they saw was no swoon or trance or temporary insensibility. They saw that same Jesus who was crucified laid down his life and become obedient even unto death. Let this be established in our minds. Our Savior really and truly died. Let us notice for one thing in this passage what honorable mention is here made of women. We are especially told that when our Lord gave up the Spirit, there were women looking on afar off. The names of some of them are recorded. We are also told that they were the same who had followed our Lord in Galilee and ministered unto him, and that there were many other women who came up with him to Jerusalem. We would hardly have expected to have read such things. We might well have supposed that, when all the disciples but one had forsaken our Lord and fled, the weaker and more timid sex would not have dared to show themselves his friends. It only shows us what grace can do. God sometimes chooses the weak things of the world to confound the things that are mighty. The last are sometimes first and the first last. The faith of women sometimes stands upright when the faith of men fails and gives way. But it is interesting to remark throughout the New Testament how often we find the grace of God glorified in women and how much benefit God has pleased to confer through them on the church and on the world. In the Old Testament, we see sin and death brought in by the woman's transgression. In the New, we see Jesus born of a woman, and life and immortality brought to light by the miraculous birth. In the Old Testament, we often see women proving a hindrance and a snare to man. The women before the flood, the histories of Sarah, Rebekah, Rachel, Delilah, Bathsheba, Jezebel are all painful examples. In the New Testament, we generally see women mentioned as help and assistance to the cause of true religion. Elizabeth, Mary, Martha, Dorcas, Lydia, and the women named by Paul to the Romans are all cases in point. The contrast is striking, and we need not doubt intentional. It is one of the many proofs that grace is more abundant under the gospel than under the law. It seems meant to teach us that women have an important place in the church of Christ, one that ought to be assigned to them, and one that they ought to fill. 
There is a great work that women can do for God's glory without being public teachers. Happy is that congregation in which women know this and act upon it. Let us notice for another thing in this passage that Jesus has friends of whom little is known. We cannot conceive a more remarkable proof of this than the person here who is mentioned for the first time, Joseph of Arimathea. We know nothing of this man's former history. We know not how he learned to love Christ and to desire to do him honor. We know nothing of his subsequent history after our Lord left the world. All we know is the touching collection of facts before us. We are told that he waited for the kingdom of God, and that at a time when our Lord's disciples had all forsaken him, he went in boldly to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus, and buried it honorably in his own tomb. Others had honored and confessed our Lord when they saw him working miracles. But Joseph honored him and confessed himself a disciple when he saw him a cold, blood-sprinkled corpse. Others had shown love to Jesus while he was speaking and living, but Joseph showed love when he was silent and dead. Let us take comfort in the thought that there are true Christians on earth of whom we know nothing, and in places where we would not expect to find them. No doubt the faithful are always few, we must never hastily conclude that there is no grace in a family or in a parish because our eyes may not see it. We know in part and see only in part, outside the circles in which our own lot is cast. The Lord has many hidden ones in the church who, unless brought forward by special circumstances, will never be known until the last day. The words of God to Elijah should not be forgotten. Yet I have reserved seven thousand in Israel. 1 Kings 19.18 Let us notice, lastly in this passage, what honor our Lord Jesus Christ has placed on the grave by allowing himself to be laid in it. We read that he was laid in a tomb hewn out of stone, and a stone rolled over the door. This is a fact that in a dying world we should always remember. It is appointed unto man to die once. We are all going to one place, and we naturally shrink from it. The coffin and the funeral, the worm and corruption, are all painful subjects. They chill us, sadden us, and fill our minds with heaviness. It is not in flesh and blood to regard them without solemn feelings. One thing, however, ought to comfort believers, and that is the thought that the grave is the place where the Lord once lay. As surely as he rose again victorious from the tomb, so surely shall all who believe in him rise gloriously in the day of his appearing. Remembering this, they may look down with calmness into the house appointed for all living. They may recollect that Jesus himself was once there on their behalf and has robbed death of his sting. They may say to themselves, The sting of death is sin and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians 15, 56 and 57. The great matter that concerns us all is to make sure that we are spiritually buried with Christ while we are yet alive. We must be joined to him by faith and conformed into his image. With him we must die to sin and be buried by baptism into his death. Romans 6, verse 4. With him we must rise again and be quickened by his Spirit. Except we know these things, Christ's death and burial will profit us nothing at all. That is the end of Rao's expository thoughts for these verses. Let us carefully consider what we have heard today. May the Lord be pleased to bring the growth for his In considering what we've just heard, would you prayerfully ask yourself and others the following questions? Sisters, are you reminded of your equal value and worth to the Lord and eagerly using the gifts he has given you to serve? Brothers, are we encouraging our sisters in their gifts? Second, do we tend to think like Elijah and say, I am alone, or do we recognize that God is at work in places we simply do not see? Do we rejoice in the fact that we are not alone? And lastly, 
The topic of death is typically avoided. But dear Christian, are we filled with hope that our Lord has conquered sin and death and has promised to raise us to newness of life? Have we been united with him in a death like his as evidence of this hope of life being ours?